Chapter Five of Curious Myths of the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Curious Myths of the Middle Ages by Sabine Baring Gould. Chapter Five, The Divining Rod, Part Two. It may be well here to give an account of the authorities for this extraordinary story. There are three circumstantial accounts, and numerous letters written by the magistrate who sat during the trial, and by an eyewitness of the whole transaction, men honourable and disinterested, upon whose veracity not a shadow of doubt was supposed to rest by their contemporaries. Monsieur Chauvin, doctor of medicine, published a Lettre à Madame la Marquise de Senosa sur les moyens dont on s'est servi pour découvrir les complices d'un assassinat commis à Lyon le 5 juillet 1692. Lyon, 1692. The procès verbal of the procureur du roi, Monsieur de Vanini, is also extant and published in the Physique Occult of the Abbé de Valmont. Pierre Gamier, doctor of medicine of the University of Montpellier, wrote a dissertation physique en forme de lettre à Monsieur de Sèvres, Seigneur de Flecher, on Jacques Aymar, printed the same year at Lyon, and republished in the Histoire critique des pratiques superstitieuses du Père Lebrun. Dr. Chauvin, was witness of nearly all the circumstances related, as was also the Abbé Lagarde, who has written a careful account of the whole transaction as far as to the execution of the hunchback. Another eyewitness writes to the Abbé Bignon a letter printed by Le Prun in his Histoire Critique cited above. The following circumstance happened to me yesterday evening, he says. Monsieur le procureur du roi here, who, by the way, is one of the wisest and cleverest men in the country, sent for me at six o'clock, and had me conducted to the scene of the murder. We found there Monsieur Grimont, director of the customs, whom I knew to be a very upright man, and a young attorney named Besson, with whom I am not acquainted, but who Monsieur le procureur du roi told me had the power of using the rod as well as Monsieur Grimont. We descended into the cellar where the murder had been committed, and where there were still traces of blood. Each time that Monsieur Grimaud and the attorney passed the spot where the murder had been perpetrated, the rods they held in their hands began to turn, but ceased when they stepped beyond the spot. We tried experiments for more than an hour, as also with the bill, which Monsieur le Procureur had brought along with him, and they were satisfactory. I observed several curious facts in the attorney. The rod in his hand was more violently moved than in those of Monsieur Grimaud, and when I placed one of my fingers in each of his hands, whilst the rod turned, I felt the most extraordinary throbbings of the arteries of his palms. His pulse was at fever heat. He sweated profusely, and at intervals he was compelled to go into the court to obtain fresh air. The Sieur Pateau, Dean of the College of Medicine at Lyon, gave his observations to the public as well. Some of them are as follows. We began at the cellar in which the murder had been committed. Into this the man with the rod, Amar, shrank from entering, because he felt violent agitations which overcame him when he used the stick over the place where the corpses of those who had been assassinated had lain. On entering the cellar, the rod was put in my hands, and arranged by the master as most suitable for operation. I passed and repassed over the spot where the bodies had been found, but it remained immovable, and I felt no agitation. A lady of rank and merit who was with us took the rod after me. She felt it begin to move, and was internally agitated. Then the owner of the rod resumed it, and passing over the same places, the stick rotated with such violence that it seemed easier to break than to stop it. The peasant then quitted our company to faint away, as was his wont after similar experiments. I followed him. He turned very pale and broke into a profuse perspiration, whilst for a quarter of an hour his pulse was violently troubled. 
Indeed, the faintness was so considerable that they were obliged to dash water in his face and give him water to drink in order to bring him round. He then describes experiments made over the bloody bill and others similar, which succeeded in the hands of Amar and the lady, but failed when he attempted them himself. Pierre Garnier, physician of the Medical College of Montpellier, appointed to that of Lyon, has also written an account of what he saw, as mentioned above. He gives a curious proof of Amar's powers. Monsieur le lieutenant général, having been robbed by one of his lackeys seven or eight months ago, and having lost by him twenty-five crowns, which had been taken out of one of the cabinets behind his library, sent for Amar and asked him to discover the circumstances. Amar went several times round the chamber, rod in hand, placing one foot on the chairs, on the various articles of furniture, and on two bureaus, which are in the apartment, each of which contains several drawers. He fixed on the very bureau and the identical drawer out of which the money had been stolen. Monsieur le lieutenant général bade him follow the track of the robber. He did so. With his rod, he went out on a new terrace, upon which the cabinet opens, thence back into the cabinet and up to the fire, then into the library, and from thence he went direct upstairs to the lackey's sleeping apartment, where the rod guided him to one of the beds, and turned over one side of the bed, remaining motionless over the other. The lackeys then present cried out that the thief had slept on the side indicated by the rod, the bed having been shared with another footman who occupied the further side. Garnier gives a lengthy account of various experiments he made, along with the lieutenant general, the uncle of the same, the abbe de Saint-Romain, and Monsieur de Puget, to detect whether there was imposture in the man. But all their attempts failed to discover a trace of deception. He gives a report of a verbal examination of Amar, which is interesting. The man always replied with candour. The report of the extraordinary discovery of murder made by the divining rod at Lyon attracted the attention of Paris, and Aymar was ordered up to the capital. There, however, his powers left him. The Prince de Condé submitted him to various tests, and he broke down under every one. Five holes were dug in the garden. In one was secreted gold, in another silver, in a third silver and gold, in the fourth copper, and in the fifth stones. The rod made no signs in presence of the metals, and at last actually began to move over the buried pebbles. He was sent to Chantilly to discover the perpetrators of a theft of trout made in the ponds of the park. He went round the water, rod in hand, and it turned at spots where he said the fish had been drawn out. Then, following the track of the thief, it led him to the cottage of one of the keepers, but did not move over any of the individuals then in the house. The keeper himself was absent, but arrived late at night, and, on hearing what was said, he roused Amar from his bed, insisting on having his innocence vindicated. The divining rod, however, pronounced him guilty, and the poor fellow took to his heels, much upon the principle recommended by Montesquieu a while after. Said he, if you are accused of having stolen the towers of Notre Dame, bolt at once. A peasant, taken at haphazard from the street, was brought to the sorcerer as one suspected. The rod turned slightly, and Amar declared that the man did not steal the fish, but ate of them. A boy was then introduced, who was said to be the keeper's son. The rod rotated violently at once. This was the finishing stroke, and Amar was sent away by the prince in disgrace. It now transpired that the theft of fish had taken place seven years before, and the lad was no relation of the keeper, but a country boy who had only been in Chantilly eight or ten months. Monsieur Goyonneau, recorder of the king's council, broke a window in his house, and sent for the diviner, to whom he related a story of his having been robbed of valuables during the night. Aymar indicated the broken window as the means whereby the thief had entered the house, and pointed out the window by which he had left it with the booty. As no such robbery had been committed, Amar was turned out of the house as an impostor. A few similar cases brought him into such disrepute that he was obliged to leave Paris and return to Grenoble. Some years after, he was made use of by the Maréchal Montrevel in his cruel pursuit of the Camisal. Was Amar an impostor from first to last, 
or did his powers fail him in Paris? And was it only then that he had recourse to fraud? Much may be said in favour of either supposition. His expose at Paris tells heavily against him, but need not be regarded as conclusive evidence of imposture throughout his career. If he really did possess the powers he claimed, it is not to be supposed that these existed in full vigour under all conditions, and Paris is a place most unsuitable for testing them. Built on artificial soil and full of disturbing influences of every description, it has been remarked with others who used the rod that their powers languished under excitement, and that the faculties had to be in repose, the attention to be concentrated on the subject of inquiry, or the action, nervous, magnetic, or electrical, or what you will, was impeded. Now Paris, visited for the first time by a poor peasant, its salon opened to him, dazzling him with their splendour, and the novelty of finding himself in the midst of princes, dukes, marquises, and their families, not only may have agitated the countryman to such an extent as to deprive him of his peculiar faculty, but may have led him into simulating what he felt had departed from him, at the moment when he was under the eyes of the grandees of the court. We have analogous cases in Bleton and Angélique Cotin. The former was a hydroscope, who fell in convulsions whenever he passed over running water. This peculiarity was noticed in him when a child of seven years old. When brought to Paris, he failed signally to detect the presence of water conveyed underground by pipes and conduits, but he pretended to feel the influence of water where there certainly was none. Angelique Cotin was a poor girl, highly charged with electricity. Anyone touching her received a violent shock. One medical gentleman, having seated her on his knee, was not clean out of his chair by the electric fluid, which thus exhibited its sense of propriety. But the electric condition of Angelique became feebler as she approached Paris, and failed her altogether in the capital. I believe that the imagination is the principal motive force in those who use a divining rod, but whether it is so solely, I am unable to decide. The powers of nature are so mysterious and inscrutable that we must be cautious in limiting them, under abnormal conditions, to the ordinary laws of experience. The manner in which the rod was used by certain persons renders self-deception possible. The rod is generally of hazel, and is forked like a Y. The forefingers are placed against the diverging arms of the rod, and the elbows are brought back against the side. Thus the implement is held in front of the operator, delicately balanced before the pit of the stomach, at a distance of about eight inches. Now, if the pressure of the balls of the digits be in the least relaxed, the stalk of the rod will naturally fall. It has been assumed by some that a restoration of the pressure will bring the stem up again, pointing towards the operator, and a little further pressure will elevate it to a perpendicular position. A relaxation of force will again lower it, and thus the rotation observed in the rod be maintained. I confess myself unable to accomplish this. The lowering of the leg of the rod is easy enough, but no efforts of mine to produce a revolution on its axis had as yet succeeded. The muscles which would contract the fingers upon the arms of the stick pass the shoulder, and it is worthy to remark that one of the medical men who witnessed the experiments made on Bleton the hydroscope expressly alludes to a slight rising of the shoulders during the rotation of the divining rod. But the manner of using the rod was by no means identical in all cases. If, in all cases, it had simply been balanced between the fingers, some probability might have been given to the suggestion above made, that the rotation was always effected by the involuntary action of the muscles. The usual manner of holding the rod, however, precluded such a possibility. The most ordinary use consisted of taking a forked stick in such a manner that the palms were turned upwards, and the fingers closed upon the branching arms of the rod. Some required a normal position of the rod to be horizontal, others elevated the point, others again depressed it. If the implement was straight, it was held in a similar manner, but the hands were brought somewhat together so as to produce a slight arc in the rod. Some who practised rhabdomancy sustained this species of rod between their thumbs and forefingers, 
or else the thumb and forefingers were closed and the rod rested on their points. Or again it reposed on the flat of the hand, or on the back, the hand being held vertically and the rod held in equilibrium. The third species of divining rod consisted in a straight staff cut in two. One extremity of the one half was hollowed out and the other half was sharpened at the end, and this end was inserted in the hollow and the pointed stick rotated in the cavity. The way in which Bleton used his rod is thus minutely described. He does not grasp it, nor warm it in his hands, and he does not regard with preference the hazel branch lately cut and full of sap. He places horizontally between his forefingers a rod of any kind given to him, or picked up in the road, of any sort of wood except elder, fresh or dry, not always forked, but sometimes merely bent. If it is straight, it rises slightly at the extremities by little jerks, but does not turn. If bent, it revolves on its axis with more or less rapidity, in more or less time, according to the quantity and current of the water. I counted from thirty to thirty-five revolutions in a minute, and afterwards as many as eighty. A curious phenomenon is that Bleton was able to make the rod turn between another person's fingers even without seeing it or touching it, by approaching his body towards it when his feet stand over a subterranean watercourse. It is true, however, that the motion is much less strong and less durable in other fingers than his own. If Bleton stood on his head and placed the rod between his feet, Though he felt strongly the peculiar sensations produced in him by the flowing water, yet the rod remained stationary. If he were insulated on glass, silk, or wax, the sensations were less vivid, and the rotation of the stick ceased. But this experiment failed in Paris, under circumstances which either proved that Bleton's imagination produced the movement, or that his integrity was questionable. It is quite possible that in many instances the action of the muscles is purely involuntary and is attributable to the imagination so that the operator deceives himself as well as others this is probably the explanation of the story of mademoiselle olivet a young lady of tender conscience who was a skilful performer with the divining rod but shrank from putting her powers in operation lest she should be indulging in unlawful acts she consulted the pere lebrun author of a work already referred to in this paper, and he advised her to ask God to withdraw the power from her, if the exercise of it was harmful to her spiritual condition. She entered into retreat for two days, and prayed with fervour. Then she made her communion, asking God what had been recommended to her, at the moment when she received the host. In the afternoon of the same day, she made experiment with the rod, and found that it would no longer operate. The girl had strong faith in it before, a faith coupled with fear, and as long as that faith was strong in her, the rod moved. Now she believed that the faculty was taken from her, and the power ceased with the loss of her faith. If the divining rod is put in motion by any other force except the involuntary action of the muscles, we must confine its power to the property of indicating the presence of flowing water. There are numerous instances of hydroscopes thus detecting the existence of a spring or a subterranean watercourse. The most remarkably endowed individuals of this description are Jean-Jacques Parang, born near Marseille in 1760, who experienced a horror when near water which no one else perceived. He was endowed with the faculty of seeing water through the ground, says l'abbe Sori, who gives his history. Jenny Leslie, a Scotch girl about the same date, claimed similar powers. In 1790, Penne, a native of Dauphine, attracted attention in Italy, but when carefully tested by scientific men in Padua, his attempts to discover buried metals failed. At Florence, he was detected in an endeavour to find out by night what had been secreted to test his powers on the morrow. Vincent Amoretti was an Italian, who underwent peculiar sensations when brought into proximity to water, coal, and salt. He was skilful in the use of the rod, but made no public exhibition of his powers. The rod is still employed, I have heard it asserted, by Cornish miners, 
but I have never been able to ascertain that such is really the case. The mining captains whom I have questioned invariably repudiated all knowledge of its use. In Wiltshire, however, it is still employed for the purpose of detecting water, and the following extract from a letter I have just received will show that it is still in vogue on the continent. I believe the use of the divining rod for discovering springs of water has by no means been confined to medieval times, for I was personally acquainted with a lady, now deceased, who has successfully practised with it in this way. She was a very clever and accomplished woman, Scotch by birth and education, by no means credulous, possibly a little imaginative, for she wrote not unsuccessfully, and of a remarkably open and straightforward disposition. Captain C., her husband, had a large estate in Holstein, near Lübeck, supporting a considerable population, and whether for the wants of the people or for the improvements of the land, it now and then happened that an additional well was needed. On one of these occasions a man was sent for, who made a regular profession of finding water by the divining rod. There happened to be a large party staying at the house, and the whole company turned out to see the fun. The rod gave indications in the usual way, and water was ultimately found at the spot. Mrs. C., utterly sceptical, took the rod into her own hands to make experiment, believing that she would prove the man an impostor, and she said afterwards she was never more frightened in her life than when it began to move on her walking over spring. Several other gentlemen and ladies tried it, but it was quite inactive in their hands. Well, said the host to his wife, we shall have no occasion to send for the man again, as you are such an adept. Some months after this, water was wanted in another part of the estate, and it occurred to Mrs. C. that she would use the rod again. After some trials, it again gave decided indications, and a well was begun and carried down a very considerable depth. At last she began to shrink from incurring more expense, but the labourers had implicit faith and begged to be allowed to persevere. Very soon the water burst up with such force that the men escaped with difficulty, and this proved afterwards the most unfailing spring for miles around. You will take the above for what it is worth. The facts I have given are undoubtedly true, whatever conclusions may be drawn from them. I do not propose that you should print my narrative, but I think in these cases personal testimony, even indirect, is more useful in forming one's opinion than a hundred old volumes. I did not hear it from Mrs. C.'s own lips, but I was sufficiently acquainted with her to form a very tolerable estimate of her character, and my wife, who has known her intimately from her own childhood, was in her younger days often staying with her for months together. I remember having been much perplexed by reading a series of experiments made with a pendulous ring over metals, by a Mr. Mayo. He ascertained that it oscillated in various directions under peculiar circumstances, when suspended by a thread over the ball of the thumb. I instituted a series of experiments, and was surprised to find the ring vibrate in an unaccountable manner in opposite directions over different metals. On consideration, I closed my eyes whilst the ring was oscillating over gold, and on opening them, found that it had become stationary. I got a friend to change the metals whilst I was blindfolded. The ring no longer vibrated. I was thus enabled to judge of the involuntary action of muscles quite sufficient to have deceived eminent medical man like Mr. Mayo, and to have perplexed me till I succeeded in solving the mystery. End of chapter 5